but behold, a cry of distress. In the song of Isaiah chapter 5, the vineyard never produced good grapes. In the parable of Jesus, it did. But wicked vine growers seized the produce, would not yield the fruit. In both the song of Isaiah chapter 5 and the parable of Jesus, the landowner suffered great loss, sowing without reaping, despite back-breaking effort and first-rate facilities. Verse, 20, uh, verse 33 of chapter 21 in the book of Matthew there was a landowner who planted a vineyard and put a wall around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower and rented it out to vine growers and went on a journey. Backbreaking effort, sparing no expense, first rate facilities, but disappointment, sowing without reaping. Worthless vines overran the vineyard. Sour grapes, the Hebrew actually means stinking things. Sour grapes, worthless, everywhere. Reason for great disappointment according to the song of Isaiah. Wicked vine growers took over the vineyard. No harvest, and worse, no air. Disappointment, that's an understatement. Disobedience, and the results, heartbreaking. Heartbreaking, according to the parable. Y'all, the vine growers, whom Jesus featured in his parable. The vine growers had forgotten to whom the vineyard belonged and who they were. They were hired hands. In verse 40, I don't know which translation of the Bible you have. I read from the New American Standard. In verse 40, the Greek noun translated owner is kurios, often rendered in the New Testament, Lord, Master. You might have an English translation that actually reads Lord or Master in verse 40. The distinction between land owner and vine grower could not have been made clearer. Like the vine growers, Sadducees and Pharisees had forgotten who they were, God's servants, and to whom Israel belonged. Israel was God's people. The role of Sadducees and Pharisees as Jewish leaders did not justify exploitation or extortion. Sounds a lot like our politicians today who think we work for them and who exploit and extort us to subsidize their comfortable, reckless living. The role of the Sadducees and Pharisees as Jewish leaders did not justify their exploitation and extortion of God's people. Hence, Jesus rebuked them by means of three parables, the second of which is our focus this morning. And later, using more plain speech and candid words in chapter 23. Permit me to look at chapter 23 in verse 2 and following. Scathing rebuke. Not in the form of parable, straight talk from Jesus. 
Chapter 23, verse 2, Jesus said, The scribes and the Pharisees have seated themselves in the chair of Moses. Therefore, all that they tell you, do and observe. But do not do according to their deeds, for they say things and do not do them. And they tie up heavy loads and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves are unwilling to move them with so much as a finger. But they do all their deeds to be noticed by men. For they broaden their phylacteries and lengthen the tassels of their garments. Oh, and they love the place of honor at banquets and the chief seats in the synagogues and respectful greetings in the marketplaces and being called by men rabbi. Verse 11. But the greatest among you shall be your servant and whoever exalts himself shall be humbled and whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you shut off the kingdom of heaven from men. For you do not enter in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you devour widows' houses, even while for a pretense you make long prayers. Therefore you shall receive greater condemnation. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you travel about on sea and land to make one follower. And when he becomes one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. Wow. That's not meek and mild Jesus. That's upset Jesus. And rightfully so. Well, how did the Sadducees and Pharisees respond to the rebuke? Violence. Not repentance. Violence. Y'all, what could be more ironic? A religious establishment using its God-given authority to crucify God's Son. What could be more ironic? In verse 42 of Matthew chapter 21, Jesus quoted Psalm 118. Jesus said to them, did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? This became the chief cornerstone. This came about from the Lord and it is marvelous in our eyes. A vivid metaphor, the cornerstone stresses two points, quick points, about the son in the parable. First, significance. Significance. The chief corner was in terms of volume. Y'all remember physical science, don't you? Volume, mass, density, of course you do. The chief corner in terms of volume, we're talking length, width, height, was sizable. Therefore, not avoidable, just like Jesus. He isn't just the way and the truth and the life. He also stands in the way, bigger than life, 